the streaming service. All right. Here's me things being live streamed. Yes. So then let's wait a few seconds to double check everything. Yes, okay, it seems to be running. I'll mute that thing because it's weird to hear myself. And I guess I'm good to go. Uh, are we good to go, John? Uh, yes, John, yeah, please uh, start, yeah. All right, thanks. Um, yeah, good morning, everyone. I'm going to uh, talk about two parts in this lecture. Uh, first of all, the lecture A is going to be about genasm. And the second part of the lecture is going to be about a recent project of ours, Scrooge, which uh, builds on top to on top of genasm is very closely related. Um, so yeah, welcome to lecture eight of our PNS genomics course. All right, let's uh, start with a high level overview of genasm. Um, so genome sequencing, um, as you know, if you're watching this course, uh, it plays a full role in an entire range of applications such as personalized medicine, uh, outbreak tracing, and the understanding of evolution. Now, um, the modern sequencing machines extract only small randomized fragments of DNA, which are called reads. And the key point here is that these reads, these have very uh, different properties depending on the sequencing technology used. Um, so this can be short reads, which are a few hundred base pairs, or long reads, which can go from thousands to millions of base, base pairs. But it's also relevant to uh, the um, alignment algorithms, which Scrooge and Genasm are, um, is the error rate in these reads, which also varies a lot. Uh, okay, there we go. Um, so how we analyze these short reads is with read mapping, um, where we align the reads to possible locations in the reference genome, um, and the goal there is to find basically where a read matches in a known reference genome and how, if it differs, if it differs, how it differs from the reference genome. And in multiple of these steps, there's a step called approximate string matching um, that's required as part of read mapping. Um, and we need the result of approximate string matching later in downstream analysis steps to um, really make useful decisions based on the reads. Uh, now we observe that these are typically uh, bottlenecked by both computational power and uh, memory bandwidth. So both the works that we're looking at will uh, try to address, uh, try to be as efficient as possible in terms of computational bandwidth. Um, so in Genasm, the goal was to appro accelerate approximate string matching by um, having a fast framework, of course, and it should be flexible in terms of supporting uh, many types of reads, for example, both these short and long reads. Um, and it should be also usable for multiple steps of genomic analysis. So I'll focus on the read mapping, but uh, Genasm can be used for, um, uh, yeah, for example, pre-aligned filtering as well. So in this work, uh, they proposed a Genasm, which is uh, based on the BITAP algorithm. And it's very interesting because it's used only bitwise operations. Uh, and then they had to um, extend and modify that algorithm a lot, such that it, it scales to long reads, um, such that we get all the output of it that we need. That means they include traceback. And uh, it also includes a hardware algorithm co-design. So while, while they took this algorithm that was already interesting, they tuned it such that it's very suitable for the hardware implementation and then made that very efficient hardware implementation work. Um, and that ends up in a very low power and very area efficient um, hardware accelerator. Okay, so uh, yeah, this, this Genasm thing, as I said, it should be flexible and should be usable for multiple use cases. And that's what ended up happening. So the proposed use cases here are read alignment, pre-alignment filtering, and edit distance calculation. 
and you can see uh, significant speed ups over prior works in all three cases. Okay, uh, so that was uh, supposed to be a short high level introduction. Now we can go into a bit more detailed background um, and take it step by step from there. Uh, so again, this read mapping pipeline that we need for genomic analysis, it's, it's really central to many end-to-end -end analysis. So we start with sequencing, we get out raw data. Let me enable a laser pointer here. We start with sequencing, we get out raw data. Then we send this raw data to read mapping to compare the raw data to a reference genome. Um, then we do variant calling to get a consensus between many noisy reads to get a really high confidence output. And then finally, the <laughs> scientific discovery part um, builds on top of all these steps. And it turns out is, uh, read mapping is typically the bottleneck here. So as you can see, for example, the Illumina uh, HiSec machine has really, really high throughput of 300 million bases per minute, um, but we cannot map that quickly. So the computational step is that so it's what slows everything down. Um, if your result is a scientific discovery, we really don't want to slow down a scientific discovery by 150x because we're computing too slowly. So uh, that's why this is important. Um, so we should look at the read mapping pipeline in detail. Now the read mapping pipeline consists of four major steps, indexing, seeding, pre-alignment, filtering, and read alignment. So the indexing step indexes a reference genome, it builds essentially a hash table based index um, from the ACE GT sequences in the reference genome. It's kind of a reverse lookup table of locations. So we can find small strings that match exactly very efficiently using the hash table. Um, and then in the seeding step, uh, we obtain a read from the sequencing machine and uh, we can check in the hash table where it might fit well. Now, this results in a huge number of mapping locations, and uh, to efficiently evaluate those, uh, we want to quickly reject many of them. So we will get many potential candidate locations of a read in the reference genome, and the pre-alignment filtering step um, should quickly determine that most of them don't fit well and reject them. Um, so, okay, yeah, we need a reference second and a query read from there, which can be obtained by just looking up parts of the reference and read based on the seeding. And then finally, the ones that pass the filter, they go into pairwise sequence alignment or read alignment. Um, and uh, that optimal alignment is then the is final output of read mapping. So as it turns out, this, this read alignment part is really very, very much of the issue is uh, in this pipeline. So if you look at this uh, recent paper, um, uh, so accelerating long read analysis on modern CPUs, um, they benchmarked as a state-of-the-art um, uh, um, read mapper, Minimap2, and uh, they observed that in many of these cases, not all of them, but in many of these cases, uh, the read alignment is really the bottleneck. So you can see here on the y-axis, execution time and just the vast majority of the execution time is occupied by the gray bar which is alignment okay so uh what what's pairwise sequence alignment um, just let me briefly repeat that although we've introduced it in the course before and um, we want to compare uh, a pair of strings while allowing substitutions insertions and deletions so a substitution means i uh, given two strings uh, some characters will just be different. So I, you won't, you will still have the same number of characters, but individual ones will be replaced by a different one. And then we have insertions. Uh, so here you have different length strings um, where there's one character missing in one of the strings and it's there in the other. And then we can have uh, deletions, which is the same as an insertion, but it's the other string that's missing the character. Okay, uh, now we want to find a set of, sub -sub of such edits, we call them, substitutions, insertions, and deletions, um, that uh, are minimal. So we want to have a minimal set of edits that yeah, 
determine all the differences between these two strings. Um, and we report afterwards all of these differences using a string like this. So uh, we say we are saying, okay, two characters are equal. One character X means one character is mismatched. Then another character is equal. Another character is mismatched, and so on. For the insertions, we do a similar thing. We just say it's an I instead of an X. So two characters exactly equal, one inserted, and then another four characters exactly equal. Similar thing for deletions. Um, this representation, that's really the key output um, of pairwise sequence alignment, this is called the cigar string. This is really port important because this was later needed by variant ca calling. So we really need this as an output. So how we classically um, calculate this is by arithmetic dynamic programming. Um, we've introduced this before in the course and believe in some overview lectures. Um, there it was called just arithmetic, uh, that it was just called dynamic programming. Um, I'm saying arithmetic dynamic programming here to contrast it with Genasm. So recall that this dynamic programming uh, works with numbers. So we initialize a top row on the leftmost column with numbers and then based on three entries we calculate uh, one new entry using arithmetic operations um so this algorithm is called nidelman wunsch and there's uh yeah, it was i guess invented in many, many places at the same time and then there's extensions on top of it uh, which were developed over the years such as smith water and goto and recently wfa which looks quite different but it's still arithmetic based so yeah most of these algorithms work over tables of numbers um, of course by the way uh, we apply the same rule this update rule of three neighbors to, to all entries and not just the first one i highlighted here okay now uh, this was arithmetic dynamic programming uh, what's interesting here is this bitap algorithm um, that's the algorithm that Genasm builds on top of. Um, this bitap algorithm uses bit vectors. So if you compare that to this needleman wunsch table down here, which contains numbers in each entry, the dynamic programming table uh, contains bit vectors. So this is zeros and ones. Um, and as you can see, also the layout is quite different. So you have one axis, which also contains ACGT at the border, like down here. But the y-axis is actually not HGT, but edits. Um, the uh, basically the uh, so this is the text in the Nidelman Wunsch uh, and Bitep case, and the y-axis in the uh, Nidelman Wunsch case, uh, let's call it pattern, um, is kind of laid out also on the x-axis, but within each bit vector. So you can see there are four letters over here. That's why each of these bit vectors is horizontally four, uh, four bits. Okay, and then the y-axis is number of edits because, well, we somehow need to represent the dimension that uh, the numbers here capture. Um, now, this bitap algorithm is particularly interesting uh, because although it still needs to take three neighbors to compute one new entry in the table, it can do so using only bitwise operations. Of course, you have bit vectors, you use bitwise operations. Um, and it's really interesting to use bitwise operations because these can be particularly efficient in hardware. So hardware kind of, if, if you have to design any kind of hardware, you typically start from, um, X, from uh, XOR gates um, or XNOR nor gates, something like that. Um, anyway, uh, the, the point is you start with from binary logic gates and you combine them for more and more complex uh, logic functions, such as maybe an arithmetic um, logic unit that you need to execute this algorithm over here. It's much nicer because if you just actually need to execute bitwise ands and bitwise ors, that's really what the lowest level of your logic can do very efficiently. Okay, so uh, this is how this table looks visually. Let's briefly look at some pseudocode of this algorithm. Um, so this byte algorithm, yeah, as I promised, is used only bitwise operations. So some bit shifts here. Um, this is a bitwise or, and then there's some bitwise ands in here, but it has some drawbacks. 
So uh, it has a large number of iterations. As you can see, it's an outer loop and an inner loop. Um, so it's a square table, of course. And OK, that means it grows quite quickly as sequences get longer. For example, for long reads, we will start to struggle. Um, and then there's data dependencies going on. So we have uh, in the inner loop data dependencies. We have, uh, the, uh, yeah, so we have um, basically the dependencies on the previous outer loop iteration, sorry. So this this old R that's referenced um, is the R from the previous iteration. So we cannot parallelize multiple of these iterations essentially. And the inner loop also has uh, dependencies because the, we are accessing um, R D minus one, which got written to in the previous iteration. So also in this direction, we cannot just easily parallelize the inner loop. Typically, to execute any of these algorithms fast, you really want to have a parallel version of it to use SIMD or something similar like that. Um, then BITAP has another issue. It's not just lacking this kind of parallelization. It's a bit slow, but it also lacks some functionality that we need. So recall that we really want to report these cigar strings, this list of edits to convert one string into the other. Um, and for that, we need something called traceback. And ByteApp out of the box does not support it. It supports calculating edit distance, but it cannot support calculating um, how it got to that edit distance. So what that cigar is doing is, and we need that. Um, so again, let me reiterate. So there's data dependency between op op uh, iterations. There's no support for traceback. And uh, due to these, yeah, two loops, it kind of doesn't really scale to long reads, which can go up to millions in characters. OK, uh, so those are algorithm level limitations. Uh, so that you could just look at the source code and kind of tell, OK, yeah, this probably doesn't work. Um, now, there's also implementation level inefficiencies, where you really want your hardware to do a good job at executing this. Um, and basically observe that there's a limited parallelism in the algorithm as well, but it, it means this really affects hardware because you have to have your hardware go sequentially over all entries. Um, and then you will have a limited memory bandwidth. So if you have this huge table and you frequently access all of these entries, then um, you have to spend most of your time just moving data instead of doing computation. And as we saw, actually, these bitwise operations, as I promised you, are cheap to compute in hardware. But that really doesn't do us any good if you're now just spending all of our time moving data and not spending any time on computation. Then what did we really gain? Um, so uh, we have five weaknesses of BITAP. And uh, in this prior work, um, we uh, observed that um, Genasm, uh, or we introduced Genasm. I guess I wasn't a co author at that point, but my um, mentor, Damla, uh, authored this paper. And she proposed uh, Genasm, which uh, basically massively improved the spy type algorithm. So, um, they introduced this as an entire framework for multiple use cases, um, and they significantly improve on top of Genas of, of on top of BITAP to improve uh, all of these weaknesses. So um, they uh, make it much more parallel, um, such that it supports long reads. Uh, they introduce a algorithm to execute traceback so they can report that cigar thing that's really necessary. And then they really efficiently implement this um, as our algorithm hardware code design. So they keep tuning uh, algorithm parameters and hardware parameters and make sure both work together really nicely and we get this nice end-to-end -end implementation of this. So it's not just someone who designs CPU and then some other person who has that C to use that CPU to program something. And it's also not just someone who designs an algorithm and someone else then has to go off and make that algorithm work somehow in hardware, but rather it's one team of experts 
who do both at the same time and can get ideal trade-offs from both. Um, and that's why I will show this, this leads to very efficient um, implementation. Okay, so this uh, Genasm DC algorithm, uh, so this is a forward calculation step. This is the part that's based on BITAP, that's why it's the same table. Uh, recall I showed this before. Um, the first step that I took is simply realizing uh, we can store all uh, computed bit vectors from that code I showed earlier. And then somehow we can do traceback. So uh, we first of all need to store all these bit vectors, which the earlier algorithm didn't do. It computed that table, but it only looked at the last column. Um, so what the, alg the previous algorithm did is it looks at this last column to find the topmost zero. Uh, and wherever that topmost zero is, that's the edit distance. Um, so here we find the topmost zero in this row. It says one edit distance. Um, and what uh, they realized in this journalism work is that, okay, if we store the entire table, we can do some traceback from here. Um, this works by backtracking where the zero came from, um, which turns out we have to follow some kind of path of zeros back to the top right. But it comes down to how did we arrive at that pink zero over here that determined the edit distance. Um, so those are the key innovations. And then there's some uh, parallelism optimization, um, a greedy windowing heuristic that cuts down on both the O notation um, and uh, it improves the compute parallelism, makes everything nice and regular. I'll refer to the paper for that though. John posted that in chat, by the way. Um, okay, so uh, as I promised, this, this is a algorithm hardware code design. So they came up with both the um, software side of this, this uh, algorithm, but also uh, they, they at the same time designed harder for it. So this is now a bit of a electrical engineering exercise. Um, how do you implement this algorithm hardware? And uh, if you're a computer science, if you're from a computer science background, uh, this will look more like a flow diagram to you than something that executes code, um, which kind of is uh, what's happening. So you have a bunch of hardware that stays in place and the data moves through the hardware that does computation over it. So we have a host CPU and some main memory, and those send uh, their data to the Genasm DC uh, accelerator that builds these tables and then a traceback accelerator that uh, obtains the cigar string. Um, so the Genasm DC accelerator consists of some uh, on-chip memory and then does some computation over there, sends it to some more on-chip memory, these TBS RAMs, and from there the TB accelerator reads whatever it needs to do for uh, achieving traceback. Um, so I'll I'll quickly animate through here, but as you can see, um, we start on the left essentially, and uh, we give it query locations. Um, yeah, we we extract part uh, of the reference and uh, the read strings from memory, send it to on-chip memory, do computation over there, write the table that we computed to more on-chip memory, read it again, do traceback, and we're done. Um, so it's, it's a nice flow diagram. Uh, what's interesting here is, and this the key benefit essentially of making this as a hardware algorithm co-design, is that we can match computation with bandwidth. So if you consider uh, a CPU, for example, a CPU has a fixed amount of memory bandwidth for a given DRAM configuration. Um, and it has a fixed amount of computation. You, you can't just dynamically add more compute units to your CPU, if you like. So that means typically, unless you get very lucky in a CPU, you end up with either too much computational power that you cannot use or uh, too much memory bandwidth that you're not using. And either way, that's wasted resources, whatever you have. Um, if you're just designing your hardware specifically for this purpose, you can perfectly match both and not waste anything. Um, so this gives a much higher performance and, and power efficiency immediately. Um, what's also interesting here is that 
we can quite cheaply uh, scale this really well. So, so we can just put many of these hardware accelerators close next to each other on chip, um, as many as we like. And since they're quite small and area efficient, we can scale it up really far. So we can have, I don't know if we desire to do that, we can have maybe hundreds of these compute cores um, on a single chip. Whereas, I mean, there are CPUs with hundreds of cores, but they get kind of large and bulky and it becomes a big overhead. As I will show in the results, this is still very efficient, even if it's scaled up significantly. Okay, so uh, let's look at some low level details of this hardware accelerator. Um, so it's designed with a technique called a uh, linear uh, cyclic stolic arrays. Um, so, so essentially what you have here is a small processing core. This is essentially the bitwise operations that we need. So by the way, as you can see, so these are bit shifts and uh, the um, bitwise or and bitwise ands that I showed in the code earlier. Um, so this is just a single instance of this, and all of these are 64-bit uh, wires, I guess. Um, but this is really efficient in hardware. In fact, these bit shift operations here, in hardware, they're not really even operations. A bit shift, a single bit shift in hardware just means you move some wires over. So you could even ignore this part. And then it's just a four input AND gate, a two input OR gate. So it's at the lowest level of hardware, really efficient. Um, and now we concatenate multiple of these compute uh, processing cores into a systolic, systolic array. So we add uh, to this combination logic some uh, register to each end, and then we uh, yeah, clone this over a bunch of time. So in each processing cycle, each of these pro processing cores uh, does some work, and then it sends its data to the next guy. And it does some work, and it sends its guy data, data to the next guy. It sends, does some work, sends data to the next guy. So we have these arrows going from one to the next. As you can see, these data arrows uh, are pattern mask, which is a variable from the code I showed, and this old R um, vector, which is also from the code I showed. Um, so it's, it's essentially iterations it's essentially iterating by sending the data across the systolic array, and it can just do so very efficiently because you're only only sending you to your direct next neighbor, and they can be directly connected with wires. It's all very nice and efficient. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we, we loop back around, by the way. That's why it's a cyclic uh, systolic array. Um, so so when, you, when this processing element uh, is done, it sends its output over to the first one. The idea here is to uh, be able to compute tables that are larger than the number of processing elements you may have. OK, and then there's, of course, a bunch of SRAMs attached to these things for reading and writing. These are a bit boring, I guess. Uh, so for uh, traceback, um, we again have some fairly simple logic. Um, these are, this is the other end of the same uh, SRAMs that I just showed. Um, and yeah, we, we basically read some data from each of these SRAMs. There's a MUX over here uh, that selects actually which data to exactly get from which SRAM part. And then it tries to reverse the operation of each of these uh, bit vectors. So recall that um, match insertion, deletion, substitution, uh, these are each a different bit vector that was calculated in the code I showed earlier. Um, and then we just need to do some simple bitwise logic to figure out, OK, which one was the one that generated the last zero in our traceback step? Uh, yes. And then, OK, we get the next arrow. Uh, we get the next pointer based on that, which goes back to the max, and we repeat until we're done with traceback. Um, so this looks quite efficient in hardware, hopefully. Now let's go into some evaluation methodology. Um, so this was uh, synthesized using a system very long. Ah, maybe let's, let me skip over this. So there's a bunch of hardware synthesis going on, basically um, a bunch of state-of-the-art software and hardware baselines at the time. Um, and then it's evaluated on three use cases. I'll focus on the first one, uh, this read alignment use case. Um, so 
uh, here we consider read mapping and the read alignment step in read mapping. Uh, so there's um, yeah, a minimap two and a BWA mem um, that we use as the uh, uh, baselines in this case and the uh, GACT um, alignment accelerator in Darwin and the Silax accelerator in GenX. Uh, the other two use cases, uh, by the way, are pre-alignment filtering and, and just edit distance calculation. Um, but I'll, I'll not focus on these because they're, I would consider them sub-problems of the first one. Um, so the uh, area and power uh, can be, yeah, when, when synthesizing, we get a list of area and power numbers. So as you can see, we can have four main components here. This DC part is the forward calculation part, the logic part that generates the tables. This is essentially the systolic array. Then uh, we have the traceback part, which is the logic for generating the cigar string. And then we have a bunch of SRAMs down here. So as you can see, the two major parts here are the TB SRAMs, which uh, use three quarters of all memory footprint. And then uh, the logic for generating the table which makes up about uh, one eighth of the logic area. And then uh, in terms of power, um, the SRAMs are uh, about 55% and about 30% uh, from the logic area. Uh, but note that uh, in total, this accelerator, which I believe this is already 32 copies uh, of the accelerator here, um, this is just 10 millimeters squared. That's tiny, right? That's 0 0.1 centimeter squared or um, about a, a hundredth of what a modern CPU uh, uses. Um, in terms of power, also three watts, that's like much less than your phone uses. Um, three watts, it's like five volts at 0 0.8, uh, 0 0.6 amps, it's nothing. Uh, you can easily supply that from a power bank, which is good because if you need this in a mobile genomics use case, let's say uh, you need this kind of low power consumption. Okay. Um, so the uh, mm, yeah. So uh, I'll focus on this first um, use case here. This. Uh, read alignment use case. Um, so we are in particular observing there's uh, speed ups uh, across all baselines, um, such as, uh, yeah, okay, we have uh, 648x speed up on average um, over the softer baselines in this case. Um, and then uh, there's um, 116x speed up over uh, the minimap baseline. So the first one was what? Oh, uh, BWAMM. So uh, BWAMM is accelerated by 648x and uh, minimap by uh, 116x with the help of this uh, alignment accelerator. Um, now, this uh, was for software baselines. Now we compare also to harder baselines. We're developing a harder accelerator, so it's just fair to not just compare to, um, you know, already fairly inefficient software versions. Um, and you observe that on average, even over state-of-the-art software baselines, there's a significant speed up to be gained. Um, and and it's not just better throughput, but also uh, better throughput per area that you invest. So if you consider a hardware accelerator, you don't really have a fixed area and power budget. Right? If, if your accelerator is too slow, you could always just make it 10 times larger. Um, so that's why it's important to also compare throughput per unit area and unit of power. Um, and uh, we can see that Genasm, even in this kind of really fair comparison, it does much better than Darwin. Uh, then we have also a short read evaluation. So previous was long reads. And we observe again, a significant speed up over uh, softer baselines. Um, and then uh, I think I'm not going to be showing this, but uh, we observe basically similar um, uh, throughput and uh, throughput per area and power numbers um, as before over harder accelerators. So, so I, I mean, 
in, in summary, I guess, as in all of these papers, the results are good. <laughs> um, the results are always good, um, and we can get, get significant speed ups with this algorithm hardware code design over prior state of the art in terms of both software and hardware. Um, the full paper goes into much more detail uh, in, in several areas, including um, yeah, computer science aspects like big O analysis, um, but also, of course, much more extensive evaluation um, and discussion of why exactly journalism is better. Um, and yeah, all of these additional use cases that I didn't go into now. So um, this is the paper. This was, by, was by the way, uh, presented uh, in Micro uh, 53 in 2020. Um, and it's available online. It's also on archive, of course. OK, so this uh, concludes lecture. 5A, now we can go to lecture 5B, and this, I think, can be a bit of a shorter one. Um, I'm presenting here my Scrooge work. Um, I'm saying my Scrooge work because I actually led this one. Um, so the prior work was led by my mentor, Damla, which is also a co-author in this one. And we presented this just recently in Recom Seek. Um, this is also uh, got recently accepted to a the bioinformatics journal. So. Uh, yeah, we we finally got that project out of the door. Um, and here, our goal was to build a, a practical and efficient implementation of the Genasm algorithm for multiple computing platforms. Before, we just had ASIC. Um, and we want to compete with state-of-the-art pairwise sequence aligners like EDLIP, KSW2, and PyWFA on all of these computing platforms. Uh, so to this end, we propose Scrooge, and Scrooge includes three novel algorithmic improvements on top of what I just showed, which in addre address some inefficiencies uh, in that algorithm that I'm going to show in a second. Um, and it includes efficient open source implementations for CPUs and GPUs that are all available on GitHub. Um, in particular, Scrooge consistently outperforms Genasm on CPU, GPU, and ASIC by some 2.1 to 5.9x, depending on the hardware. And uh, Scrooge also up from state of the art CPU and GPU baselines, including KSW2, EDLIP, and PyWFA. So, uh, yeah, we just looked at the ASIC of Genasm, and the key question here is can we do better? Um, in particular, uh, yeah, make, make, can we build a more efficient hardware accelerator? And then, if you look at this commodity hardware, which Genasm didn't target at all, um, so commodity hardware would be something you can buy like CPUs and GPUs. Um, and the question here is, uh, is Genasm suitable to this commodity hardware or can it be made suitable maybe? So to answer these questions, we started with uh, a memory bandwidth analysis. We plotted a roofline model. Um, so the first question was, uh, does commodity hardware have enough bandwidth for the, for the Genasm algorithm? So the roofline model lets you plot a uh, compute throughput of a given hardware against its memory bandwidth. And then we can, from this chart, uh, look at some interesting uh, insights. So the y-axis here plus throughput, higher is better. We'd always, uh, and x-axis is operational intensity. So this is just what we computed uh, off of the Genasm algorithm. Um, the desired operating point is always at the uh, peak compute throughput of the given hardware. That's where we'd like to be. And um, we know that the, the a given algorithm always operates on its vertical line along the operational density. Now, uh, the actual operating point um, of these uh, algorithms is unfortunately bound by the intersection point between the algorithm and its memory bandwidth. So uh, if you check here, um, there's uh, the intersection point between the algorithm's operational intensity and the memory bandwidth is significantly below the desired operating point. Um, so that's lost performance due to limited bandwidth. If we had sufficient bandwidth, this blue line would be much higher, and the orange and the uh, violet points would meet. Um, but we don't have that unlimited bandwidth in commodity hardware, that's why we're losing performance. And that's the first inefficiency we observe in the Genasm algorithm. Um, so Genasm cannot saturate commodity hardware with computation due to limited bandwidth. So uh, this was off-chip bandwidth that I showed, actually. Um, On-chip memory can be much faster than off-chip memory. Uh, and 
in that case, the question to ask is, well, do we have enough on-chip memory to fit all the data, right? And if we can't fit all the data in on-chip memory, then it's not, not that much of an issue in terms of bandwidth. So uh, let's plot from the data sheets of these uh, two recent CPUs and GPUs, um, the respective on-chip memories of the fastest cache levels. And then we uh, plot against that, the memory footprint of the Genasm algorithm. Um, and as you can see in the CPU case, it's already a bit of an issue. The CPU doesn't have uh, enough footprint. Uh, it doesn't have enough on-chip memory capacity for the memory footprint. Well, in the GPU case, it kind of barely works out. Um, but uh, once we introduce simultaneous multi-threading, the picture changes significantly. So simultaneous multi-threading, this is called uh, hyper-threading in Intel speak. Um, what this means is you use multiple threads per, per hardware core. So if you have a CPU core, you want to have two alternating threads running on it to constantly have something to work on in, in your compute units. Um, but having these two threads running in the single core means you also need to have two problem instances, or in this case, two uh, dynamic programming tables in memory at the same time to be able to yeah, work on these problem instances. That means uh, your memory footprint doubles and the problem exacerbates. Um, and also in the GPU case, actually, it, it looks much worse now because GPUs for simultaneous multithreading don't just need two instances, but many, like four, five, six instances. Um, so this is because they're just designed with massive simultaneous multithreading in mind. Um, but then the available on chip memory also on the GPU is nowhere near enough to fit all of Genasm's memory. And this is the second inefficiency we observe. Um, Genasm just doesn't have enough memory footprint, uh, especially when multiple instances are kept in memory for simultaneous multi-threading. Okay, so um, uh, so we observe that uh, there's some unnecessary work in Genasm as well. Um, in particular, uh, if you check this table again, um, the traceback starts from this first zero in the leftmost column, and you observe that there's a significant range there that cannot be reached by traceback. Um, so we have this first zero, and then from here, traceback only goes to the right and upwards. That's always the case, actually. Um, and if that area cannot be reached by traceback, then we can call this unnecessary work because we're computing it, but just never ever looking at it again. Okay, so uh, in summary, we have three inefficiencies in the Genasm algorithm, a large memory balance requirement, um, a large memory footprint, and some unnecessary work. Okay, uh, so to, to address these inefficiencies, we propose uh, Scrooge. Scrooge consists of um, memory improvements and efficiency improvement. The memory improvements uh, reduce both the memory footprint and data movement of uh, Scrooge. So we have uh, Senest or entries not edges and Dent, discard entries not used by traceback. And then the efficiency improvement el eliminates the unnecessary work that we had identified. Call this one early termination. Um, so uh, Sene, um, stands for store entries, not edges. And it comes from the observation that, uh, so if you look at the single entry over here, um, what's actually stored by Genasm is not one of these entries, but rather the three edges that produced, three out of the four edges that produced this entry. Um, so there are really three edges that are stored by Genasm um, to then be able to trace back where a given zero came from uh, in here. Now, what we observe is that actually it's sufficient to just uh, store the entry itself, not the ingoing edges. Um, so Scrooge only stores that, which is three times less uh, bits than, than all of the edges. And that out of the box uh, gives us a stress reduction in memory footprint and data movement. It comes at the slide compute overhead to regenerate the edges that are needed during traceback, but it turns out this is a very minor overhead. Okay, uh, then we have the dent improvement, discard entries not used by traceback. 
Um, and this one comes from the observation that uh, traceback here is essentially confined um, due to, to a small area in the dynamic programming table. Um, this is due to the windowing heuristic. I didn't introduce this in detail. I would refer to the paper for that. But essentially, it turns out that due to this windowing heuristic, traceback can only go uh, two bits to the right uh, in a four-bit table. And for a large table, it's about for half the bits. And all of the remaining bits um, are never reached, and they do not need to be stored. They do need to be computed because the purple bits depend on them, of data dependencies, but they do not need to be stored for later traceback. And uh, just discarding them uh, after computation gives a forex reduction in memory footprint and data movement. Okay, uh, third, we have this early termination improvement, ET. Um, and the key idea here is that when we build the table top down, uh, we just stop building the table as soon as we find that zero in the leftmost bit. So recall that the unnecessary work um, down here was uh, was to compute the part of the table down here that can never be reached by traceback. So if we stop building the table as soon as we find that zero uh, that indicates the edit distance and then start traceback from there, then the area that cannot be reached by traceback is also not computed and this eliminates the unnecessary work. Um, we compute, we, we calculate uh, that this uh, is at least 25% uh, on average of the entire dynamic programming table. Um, and when uh, you have very similar sequence pairs, then this is even much more. So it's 25% when you have completely random sequence pairs. And if, let's say, the um, two strings differ by only one edit or even zero edits, then we can stop even in the first row immediately and do almost no computation, which makes this highly efficient. So yeah, if we uh, implement all of these improvements uh, for both CPUs and GPUs. We open source them as uh, on GitHub and it's really easy to use library interfaces. Um, and uh, give me a sec. Sorry for that interruption. I just had a brave, brave workman I think he has to do a work in my apartment while I'm giving a lecture. It's amazing. Um, so uh, um, yeah, we open source all of our implementations uh, in uh, on, on GitHub and uh, this should be really easy to use library interfaces. And our GPU version um, targets NVIDIA GPUs for of reasonably uh, recent compute capability. Um, so yeah, it's all available over here. And uh, of course, we evaluate our implementations um, quite comprehensively. So we simulate some long reads, we get real short read data, and we uh, evaluate on these recent CPU and GPU architectures. And we also do an uh, ASIC evaluation based on prior log logic synthesis. Um, so uh, we plot long read throughput, higher is better, y-axis is uh, alignments per second. And we observe that on the CPU, Scrooge here in blue uh, outperforms all, base, all CPU baselines. And on GPU uh, for long reads, also Scrooge outperforms all baselines as well. Um, in particular, it outperforms Genasm by 2.1x uh, on CPU and 5.9x on GPU. Uh, on short reads, um, uh, we again plot alliance per second on the y-axis, higher is better. And uh, the uh, CPU throughput is again best for Scrooge. Uh, it outperforms all baselines. Same thing on GPU again. In particular, Scrooge outperforms Genasm by 3.8x on CPU and 2.4x on GPU. Um, third, we evaluate uh, ASIC results. So. Uh, we observe that Scrooge, when implemented as an ASIC, introduces really no significant computation overheads over Genasm, um, while its uh, on-chip memory is much cheaper than Genasm's due to the memory footprint and bandwidth reductions. Um, it uses uh, 18x 
less chip uh, area and ADX less power, just the on-chip memory itself um, uh, due to these improvements. Um, in particular, then, when we calculate these improvements for the entire chip, this results in Scrooge using overall 3.6x less chip area and 2.1x less power than the original Janassen ASIC. And we evaluate uh, yeah, everything in much more detail in our paper, including uh, throughput sensitivity to each of our proposed improvements, uh, scaling results, accuracy analysis, and uh, sensitivity analysis to some um, algorithm parameters. Uh, and of course, then we also give uh, a detailed ASIC breakdown in terms of how that area came to be. Yeah, um, we have our paper on archive. We have our accepted paper on bioinformatics, our archive version that we keep updating with new results as we have them. And of course, Scrooge on GitHub. So let me conclude um, by saying, OK, uh, pairwise sequence alignment is computationally costly and a common step in bioinformatics plans. Genasm is this prior work and it's a really promising algorithm um, for efficient pairwise sequence alignment. Uh, our goal was to build a practical and efficient implementation of Genasm algorithm for multiple computing platforms and compete with state of the art pairwise sequence aligners. To this end, we propose Scrooge, which includes three novel algorithmic improvements on top of Genasm, um, which addresses some of its inefficiencies. Um, and we introduce efficient open source CPU and GPU implementations of the improved algorithm. We observe that Scrooge consistently outperforms Genasm, such as by 2.1x on CPU, 5.9x on GPU, and has 3.6x better area efficiency when implemented as an ASIC. Um, finally, we observe that Scrooge consistently outperforms state-of-the-art CPU and GPU baselines, including KSW2, EDLIP, and PyWFA. So with that, I'll uh, conclude. Uh, and thanks a lot for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll happy, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, I'll end the meeting here in a few seconds. All right. Thanks so much for attending. And uh, see you next week. Bye-bye.